Welcome to Southern Home Talk. This episode is going to be about humidity and moisture, the most destructive force on your home, by Inspector Chuck Phillip of South Alabama Home Inspections. Do you know what the humidity level is in your house? Chances are most of the people watching this video have no clue what their actual humidity is, and it's invisible, and therefore, because it's invisible, we as humans only pretty much address things that we can see with our naked eye. But the truth of the matter is, is humidity is actually destroying your house, and it's doing it in latent ways. Since humidity, or water vapor, is lighter than air, it travels through our structure, into our wall cavities, and there it creates tremendous latent problems only to be discovered at a later time, and usually that's when it takes a lot of money to repair those problems. I've tried to make this video as short as possible and to the point, and I hope that you'll watch it in, in its entirety, because I have no doubt that by watching this video, you'll know what some of these issues are and how it is destroying your house, but I also offer solutions to this as well. And the solutions are a lot cheaper than the actual repairs. So please stay tuned for the rest of this video. Have you ever looked up at your ceiling registers and noticed that they're sweating? If any of them are, chances are you have a very high humidity problem indoors. You can see right here where mold is starting to form on the vents here. What's happening is, is the water vapor inside your house is condensing here on the cold surface of the steel here, making dew point and eventually saturating the drywall here. This, this can become so saturated that it can penetrate the attic side of the house and also wet the insulation on the top side of it. One of the reasons you don't want to wait to do something about this issue in your house is that mold can form within 24 to 48 hours. It does not take long for this to express itself. Now granted in this picture here, this has probably been a long-term moisture issue that expressed itself in the drywall area around this register. Mold loves to grow in cool, damp areas. The high humidity in the house, making dew point on the grill here, has saturated the drywall to such a degree that mold can grow with ease. Dew point is the temperature of any surface in which water vapor can turn back into a liquid form. A good example of this is the windows inside your house. If you look at your windows early in the morning, you'll probably notice on some of them that there's water on the outside window pane. And this is where the water vapor outside has met the cold surface of your window making dew point. If you have sweating windows on the inside of your house, you have very high humidity problems and they should be immediately addressed. Have you ever come home from work after a long day and wondered why your towel was still damp after taking a shower maybe eight or nine or ten hours earlier that morning? Well, chances are you've got high humidity and the air has become so saturated in your house that the towel can't dry. Usually this is a sign that most people notice first off. Sometimes they may think that someone may have used their towel to dry off with, but what the real reason is is that air in your house is so saturated with moisture that the towel can't dry. If you see the humidity monitor here on the left, it's showing 93% humidity. Humidity there again is an invisible issue. You will never know that you have this problem unless you either use a monitor like this or maybe you'll notice your damp towel when you come home from work. Humidity monitors are relatively inexpensive. What you're looking at here is a wireless system. And these are the sensors here that you can place in areas where humidity needs to be monitored. The base station also serves as a monitor too. So if you have an attic and a garage, you would place one of these in the attic, the other in the garage, and the base station would serve as the monitor for the inside of the house. And down below would be where the wireless sensors are transmitting from. You really can't go by these pictures because I pulled this system out so it could be photographed. So you have to disregard the settings here at the bottom. I highly recommend that you install one of these. Every homeowner should be monitoring their temperature and humidity in their house and in other areas where, like the attic and the crawl space, 
and maybe the garage as well. So take the time, go online and review the different models that are out there and, and pick the one that's best for you. We also install these systems too, but you can do this yourself. What you're looking at in this picture here is a roof jack. These are often made of some pliable material like plastic. And over time they will age in the sun and then they will form cracks along the baseline here, which you see here. This is allowing rainwater and moisture to enter the attic space. Whenever you replace your shingles, these two should also be replaced at the same time. But you should also go up on your roof periodically and inspect these. If you're unable to do so, then you should hire an inspection company to do this for you. What you're looking at in this picture here is the underside of the roof jack we looked at earlier. You can see where a homeowner or someone has come in and tried to caulk this up to repair it, but it's failed and it's still leaking into the decking up here. A qualified roofer should be called in to make this sort of repair. Most of us have duct work running through the attic. You can see in this picture the staining on the drywall here. This is caused by high humidity making dew point on the duct work. Over time, mold will start forming here and most likely on the underside as well since it's cooler there. Humidity in the attic should be monitored this is best well done with a wireless sensor with the base station inside so that corrective measures can be taken to prevent this from happening. What you're looking at in this picture here is mold that is formed on the roof decking. This is inside the attic. Most people will never know they have this problem unless they go up in their attic quite frequently. It doesn't take too long for this to start forming. And this is the biggest reason why a wireless sensor should be put in the attic to monitor those conditions there. If this mold's allowed to grow any further, it can actually start weakening the structure itself and also create health issues down below. In this photograph here, this is from a relatively new house. It is not uncommon for some builders to not vent the bathroom fans to the exterior of the building. Right here is the duct work that terminates right here at the soffit area. Moisture rises like helium, and so it's unlikely to vent down below through the soffit area since it does rise. As a result of this, you can see all the mold areas here that's formed. All exterior bathroom vents should be vented to the exterior of the building to prevent this from happening. Often when you see staining in the ceiling, there's usually been a very long time leak that's been occurring in the attic. There's several reasons why this may not become apparent. Often there's insulation and usually quite a few layers of it in this attic space. It can take some time for it to leak down through all those layers and express itself to the ceiling down below. But in the meantime, all kinds of problems have been taking place in the attic. It's also diminished the effectiveness of the insulation if it gets wet. Plus, Long-term moisture exposure to wood structure will weaken that as well. Plus, it will lead to mold in the attic and down below. So if you see staining in your ceiling, you need to assume that this has been from a very long-term leak. This is also another example of a long-term leak that's been taking place. What's not apparent is the top side of this, where there was a roof leak that started leaking down on the drywall above. Also, what's not apparent is the moisture content of the drywall itself, since the paint is concealing that as well. But it's allowed enough moisture to take place to where mold could form, and there's a substantial amount of mold on the top side of this, which is bled through to the ceiling side. This is another reason why your attic should be inspected periodically. This is another example of extreme mold here. What we're looking at is black mold. And this is a result of a roof leak where the water has run down the rafters and has drained to the corner area of the room. Behind this wall, there's probably substantial black mold behind it. Usually the mold will start behind the wall structure and then express itself to the surface. So whatever this looks like here is probably much worse underneath the wall. That's why it's very important to monitor all roof and attic leaks for piping up there that can bust as well. Many of us have plumbing that runs through the attic space. 
And often what happens sometimes is fittings will leak up there in the attic. And also, when you turn the water on and off, the pipes will jump. And usually they can rub themselves on the sharp edges of the boards wearing a pinhole leak into the pipe itself. That's why it's important that you hire a home inspector occasionally to come out and do a thorough inspection of your house. We have all the tools and equipment, including thermal imaging, that can discover these types of leaks. Some of you may have rotted boards along the outside of your house. What we're looking at here is fascia. It's not uncommon to see some of this rotted. And what happens is we often overlook this sort of thing, thinking it's more cosmetic, but it's really a serious issue that could face the house. Moisture is attracted to dry areas, and usually it's drier past this point over the soffit area. So when this starts soaking up water, it will migrate into the attic structure itself. These should never be left unattended. These should be immediately repaired. Another point of advice I would give too is whenever you paint your soffit area or fascia, you should use a very good high quality paint, preferably a semi-gloss paint, but it's got a fungicide built into it. I also recommend adding a product called M1, which is an additional fungicide to help protect the wood structure. This is another example of extreme neglect here of subsiding. You should never let leaves build up along wall structures because this will hold moisture back to it. But in addition to this, this should be cleaned off and protected, whether it be paint or stain that's resistant to the elements here in South Alabama. If this is left further unattended, this moisture can actually wick into the wall cavity, creating moisture and structural issues there. As a home inspector, I often find rot around door frames. This is not uncommon here in South Alabama. Probably the better practice would not be use wood at all for these types of doors, especially exterior. But since most of us do have this type, it's important that we take extra measures to protect these parts of the door frame. What happens is, is in the rain, when it comes down, it will splash up and keep this area constantly moist and wet. Termites also like moist areas, and they love wood for food. So this is a very good entry point for termites. It's important that you use a very good, high-quality paint to protect your wood around door frames. And there again, I also recommend the use of product M1, which is a very good fungicide. You can see that the moisture has become so extensive that it's caused rust here on the door. These are actually metal doors. In the previous slide, I described how moisture can damage the door frame on the outside. But what can happen if that's left unaddressed is eventually moisture will wick its way into the house itself. And this picture is a good example of that. Moisture has already come through the structure and is now wicking its way around through the baseboards inside the house. But what's not seen it's the studs that's in the wall. These two are probably also giving moisture damage as well, and they could be mold forming here as well. What you're looking at in this slide here is long-term moisture. And most likely what's contributed to this is this hose bib. There's been so much moisture that it's supported the growth of plants along the wall. If these plants are allowed to keep growing, it can damage the mortar joints. Anytime you have a leaky hose faucet, it should be repaired. Because not only for this reason here, but water can often leak back into the wall structure, creating problems there. I recommend that these problems be fixed, this growth be removed, and properly sealed for protection. Also go to our YouTube channel for ways of how to fix this problem. A quick drive through most any neighborhood, you will see vegetation planted right up against the house. And this may look good to some people, but this is probably the most destructive thing you can do to your home. Because what this vegetation does is hold moisture back to the wall. Brick is like a sponge. It will absorb moisture. And bushes and vegetation like that can hold moisture in these locations for very long periods of time. And usually after this is removed, you'll see a substantial amount of mold and fungus along the wall cavity. 
This also contributes to high humidity con conditions inside the house. It's really the best practice is to not have any vegetation at all planted right up against the wall structure. The rule states 12 inch clearance, but really in, in reality, especially here in South Alabama, you should really have no vegetation growing near the wall structure at all. In this slide here, you can see where the bushes have been removed from the wall, but it's left this long running stain all the way down it. All this is fungus and mildew. If you go further down, you can see this round stain right here, and that's simply caused from the air conditioner being too close to the wall. Anytime you have anything too close to the wall structure, it can create mold and fungus issues. All this should be power washed off and then sealed with a brick sealer. I recommend Cycle Seal for this. Please go to our YouTube channel and check out the video we have on Cycle Seal. It's a very good product. It lasts for many years if used correctly. This slide here is another illustration of why vegetation doesn't really have to be that close to the wall in order for it to cause fungus issues, as you see in this slide. It's probably a at least three foot distance between the wall and the vegetation. And the vegetation here is really not that bushy. But also contributing to this problem is the leaf litter here along the bottom. Leaf litter, mulch, pine straw can hold moisture for a long period of time. And that's why it's just not a good idea to, to use mulch or any other type of product like that for your landscaping. The better practice here would be use large rocks large irregular rocks that won't migrate. This wall too should be clean and sealed with a good brick sealer. Cycle seal works on concrete block, masonry, and also brick, including the mortar joints. My house is kind of like a UL laboratory. I've tried many different products here, and one of the best outdoor products I've found is Wet and Forget. It really works pretty good. The way you work this is to put it into a pump up sprayer diluted and then spray all the areas that you see mold and fungus on. It doesn't really work that well on very heavy thick layers of it, but if it's not too thick it works pretty well. You pretty much just spray it on and then forget it. And in a short amount of time it usually disappears. This is a product I've talked about in some of the previous slides. Uh, this is Zycosil. It's a product made in India, and it's one of the best substances I've ever used for sealing brickwork. This one jug cost probably close to $200, but it is a concentrate, and it was able to do my entire 2,000 square foot house. However, it's very important that you follow the directions when you use this. When you use this in a pump up sprayer, you want to be careful not to spray any of the glass of your windows because it will permanently etch them. The way this works is by penetrating the brick, the porous areas of the brick and also the mace or including the joints here. The best time to apply this is in the fall when you have dry weather. You really want to get your brick and masonry as dry as possible before you apply this substance. I recommend that if you have a day of rain, that should be the day that you do your power washing, especially if there's going to be a, at least two weeks of dry weather ahead, because you want to wait as long as possible before you apply Zycosil on the surface. You really want your brick to be as dry as it possibly can get before you apply it. You'll see this stuff soak up into the brickwork relatively quick. After it's applied, it usually becomes a permanent part of the brick and the concrete it was applied to. In fact, you won't even be able to power wash it out. And theoretically, it's supposed to last approximately 10 years. I applied this on my house in 2016, and it looks like I just power washed my house yesterday. So I highly recommend Zycosil as a waterproofing compound for brick and masonry. Well, here we go again with another slide with vegetation planted too close to the house. But the purpose of this slide is not to talk about the wall, but to talk about the soffit areas. It was quite common practice back in the 60s and 70s for people to plant azaleas 
right against the house. So you're looking at probably 30, 40 years of growth that's been left unchecked. But the big problem here is when you have bushes to this degree, they hold moisture for a very long period of time. And over that time period, it evaporates. And that evaporation is actually water vapor, which rises like helium. If you go outside and look up in the air, you'll see clouds up above you, and all those clouds are water. So what happens here is the slow evaporation occurs, and it rises up into the soffit of this house and into the attic space. This is called continuous soffit, or continuously vented soffit. It's vented all the way down, all the way across. So when that water vapor rises, it rises through that and goes into the attic structure, where it can create mold problems there. The better practice is to remove all this, and if you're going to have any kind of plants at all, to plant them outside the soffit area. So that way, when moisture does rise out of it, it rises past the soffit. Vegetation can be destructive in more than one way, as you can see from this banana tree that's made its way into the attic space. You can see right here where part of the banana tree has grown into the soffit itself. It's held moisture there too, and so moisture wicks up through the stems of this tree into the attic, creating moist conditions on the back side of this, and that's why you can see this is rotted and starting to fall down. It's just not a good idea to have trees or bushes or any kind of other vegetation growing real close to your house here in South Alabama. It's just not a good idea to do it. We just have too much moisture, too much rain, that eventually is going to create problems somewhere down the line for your house. I talked about in the previous slides about what not to do. In this slide here, this is a very good example of what to do. You can see that the plants here are very small in statute. They're also planted far enough away from the wall structure. And another thing to note here is they're planted far enough away that when these things do evaporate their moisture, most of it's probably going to miss the soffit area here and not go into these vents. If you'll notice, this entire bed here is planted with rocks. This is number four size rock. They're fairly large in size and they're irregular. And what, what's good about this size rock is that you can come in here with a leaf blower and blow out your flower bed without blowing the rocks out of it too. Another good thing about rocks is that it's not a very conducive environment for termites or any other type of insects to want to make nests there. It creates a very nice, neat, dry area for your plants to grow in, and it also protects the structure as well. Rocks are more expensive than mulch or pine straw, but the good thing about rocks is they last forever. I have no doubt if you redo your flower bed to this direction, you'll be glad you did. I took this photograph a few days ago at an open house, and I can understand why sellers want to spiffy up their house, especially if they're trying to sell it. And what this seller did, or had a landscaping company do, is spread pine straw along this foundation wall. It's just going to be a matter of a few days to a few weeks before mold and fungus starts forming along this line. The short is, it's just not a good idea to use pine straw, mulch, or wood chips for your landscaping projects. The better option is always going to be large, irregular sized rocks, plus it facilitates the draining of the soil. What you're looking at in this picture is corrective action being taken. This is a large load of number four regular sized gravel that's been delivered. You can look back here in the far back and you can see the foundation bit here. This has since been sealed up. What's happened over the last 20, 30 years is this, all this earth has been allowed to accumulate and almost pass the foundation bit itself. Now that this flower bed has been cleaned out, this can all be spread out evenly across the surface. If you need large quantities of gravel, you can do a Google search and just type in the word gravel supplier and several should pop up. Home Depot also sells these in 25 to 50 pound bags, but in this case here, it was the better price to go ahead and purchase it online and have it delivered by the dump truck full. 
What you're looking at in this photograph here is a garage that's been closed up for quite some time. It had some gaps in the weather stripping in the garage door which allowed moisture to enter in. This looks like dust on the floor, but it's actually mold. All this is white mold. It's very important that you monitor the humidity level in your garage. It's also equally important that you take corrective measures if you start to see high humidity levels. This is one of the biggest places where mold is allowed and also moisture is allowed to enter the house. As you can see in this photograph, the weather seal does not make it all the way down to the garage floor. This is allowing water to pour in from the bottom and pool in this location. It's also left behind some mold and fungus. You never want to let your garage door weather stripping go bad. It always needs to be sealed to the ground bottom. Also, don't leave your garage doors open during hot, humid days. This can allow a lot of moisture to enter this space. What you're looking at in this photograph here is an attic staircase opening. And along this frame here, what appears to be overspray, is actually white mildew that is formed there. Often these attic staircases are either in the garage or in our hallways, but it really doesn't matter which location they're in, they're subject to high humidity at this point. Basically what happens is if we don't let our bath fans run long enough, moisture will make it into the hallway, rise up above, settle here on this cooler area here, and since it is porous, it would kind of hold it there for some time. This in turn will create this white mildew we see here. Take the time and pull down your attic stairs and see if you have any on your frames. As far as I'm concerned, this is one of the best inventions that was ever created. It's called the mini split or the ductless air conditioning system. They're very efficient. Some of these are high as 30 sear. This particular model here will cool, heat, and dehumidify. The greatest thing I like about this is the fifth fact it will dehumidify. At nighttime, I can actually turn down my central system and just cool the bedrooms. During the daytime, I turn it into the dehumidifier, which helps bring the, de the humidity down to 45% or better inside the house. I highly recommend these. These are very good for also garages, especially as cheap as they've become. For about $800, you can get one of these with the compressor and it will heat, cool, and dehumidify the garage. Due to the fact we have these all around our house, and, if, and also these are such large openings, it's very important to keep the windows caulked at every point, moisture or air can transfer. Also, don't leave your windows open during humid weather. This can let a large amount of moisture to enter the household. So keep this in mind. Keep all your windows caulked and airtight as best as possible. Most of us all have doors on our house, and we also take for granted the weather stripping that seals them up. You can see in this photograph here, where there's a pretty good gap right here where the two doors meet. Always take the time to secure the weather stripping on your doors to make sure that there's no gaps. Air can come through this gap through your air conditioning as well. Depending on where your return is, the return may be close enough to where it can draw humid air into the house this direction. What's missing in this picture? You notice that the doors above the microwave oven are open. Anytime I do an inspection, I open these to see if there's any duct work here. Down below is a microwave, and the ventilation fan is built into this. Most microwaves are built to where they can be ducted from above, but most of the time it's just a microwave with a recirculating fan that pulls air from the top of the range and circulates it through filters. Anytime I find non-ducted microwaves or non-ducted range hoods, I always write this up as a defect. All kitchens should be externally ventilated, especially to remove moisture, but they also need to be installed to remove heat as well. The kitchen produces large amounts of moisture when we cook, and even our microwave can produce moisture through the cooking process. The dishwasher also produces a lot of moisture. Kitchens are just simply a high moisture area and they all should be externally vented to the outside. What you're looking at here is a simple diagram of a house with a basement, a middle floor, top floor, and attic. And this shows how moisture moves through our house. 
In this basement scenario, you can see where the cooler air is here at the bottom. We have a water heater down here, washer dryer, maybe even ductwork for the air conditioning system. Often what happens is this cool pipe and ductwork will condensate moisture and it will eventually drop down onto the floor. It will also eventually evaporate and it will rise up through all the floor levels and sometimes it will settle in the attic and that's where mold is often found. The mold can also get in any of these other locations throughout the house. So that's why it's very important to control moisture even in the lower levels of the house. Even if this basement wasn't here, this now first floor becomes the cooler level and the same theory plays out. In this slide you're looking at a defective ventilation fan in a bathroom. You can see the moisture on both sides of it. The most likely scenario is, is there's no ductwork connected to it and it's just simply venting right there at this location allowing moisture to build and also soak into the drywall. If you look over here at this light fixture, you can see rust forming around the outer edges of it. It's very important that your bathroom exhaust fan exhausts to the outside of the building. And you also want to run your bath fan at least 10 minutes after taking a shower to fully remove the moisture from the area. This is a thermal image of a bathroom ceiling. On the right, is the bathroom ventilation fan. The thermal image shows this is actually venting into the attic. This cooler area here is where water has been allowed to pool. Sometimes we use thermal imaging to find these types of defects. This is a photograph of a bathroom ceiling. You, you can see at the left where mold is starting to bleed through the paint. Someone has painted over mold. On the right, it has bled through pretty good. They have a ventilation fan, but if you don't run it for at least 10 minutes after taking a shower, moisture can start to build all on the wall cavity and the ceiling. If you do go back to repaint this, you have to remove all the mold that has to be killed, and you should use a paint with a good fungicide in it. I also recommend the paint additive called M1. It is a very good fungicide. It can be used on both exterior and interior latex paints, including oil paints. <clears throat> As I've said before, most moisture damage is unnoticed. It's usually latent. It's usually hidden in places we normally wouldn't look. You can see on this light switch there's a lot of rust. And that's common in bathrooms, but it can also be anywhere within the house where there's high moisture content. You would never know that this was rusting with the switch plate cover over it. Sometimes you can find mold in these areas as well. If you see dust around the outlet covers, or switch covers in this case, it tells you that your HVA system is also drawing in air and should be sealed. They make cover plates that are insulated. They also make these gaskets you can put over your cover plate as well to seal these up. Another sign that may go unnoticed to some people is rusting hinges. If you have hinges that are rusting, especially interior door hinges, this should be a telltale sign that you have very high moisture content in the house. If you see that your hinges are rusted in the bathroom, more than likely you're not running your fans long enough or the fans improperly sized for that area. So if you don't have a moisture meter, my recommendation is to go look at the hinges on the doors inside the house. If you see rust, chances are you got a high humidity problem. Most of us believe that our air conditioners will dehumidify the house. Well, it does do some of that if you have a single stage, you know, like the one we're looking at in this photograph. But it's not likely that it's going to dehumidify the house to the degree that it should, unless maybe if you have a variable speed system. A variable speed system that has a dedicated dehumidification function usually does a pretty good job of dehumidifying the house. These systems cost quite a bit more than your standard system, but even they can have their shortcomings. Depending on how much moisture load is being put on your house, you may have to take additional measures too to keep it dehumidified. You also don't want to let vegetation grow up around the outdoor system. This can cause the system to have all kinds of service issues in the future. 
You want to keep it clean and also want to have them serviced twice a year. The best time to service your system is in the fall and in the spring. Also don't forget to change your air conditioning filter. This is really a critical point in your system and it's easy to forget these sometimes. But these should be changed more often during the summertime or the warmer months since we run the system more often. It's also better not to use these high MERV filters either, the ones that filter out the smallest microns, because this too also restricts flow into the system. Really the best filters to use is the washable filters that you can purchase off Amazon. I like these because you save a lot of money and they can be cleaned. But you also don't want to put them back in wet. You want to let these filters thoroughly dry before they're put back. This is what's on the other side of your air conditioner filter. It's called an evaporator coil. It's also called an A coil from the design here that you see. This is where the air comes through, goes through these coils, and this is what cools your house. If you have a dirty filter or you don't change your filters often enough, you can see all the dust that's built up here. This dust can now retain moisture and also mold can grow here as well. It's very important that you have your HVA system serviced twice a year and your evaporator coil is cleaned when needed. A properly functioning AC system can condensate anywhere between 7 and 20 gallons of water a day. This is a lot of moisture being pulled out of your house. You can see this bucket is over one gallon full. It took about two hours to fill it. So that tells you how much moisture an air conditioning system can pull out of a typical house. Now granted, this system here was a variable speed unit which is designed to pull out more moisture. You also want to let your condensate lines move out at least one foot away from the foundation. If you start to see that water is continually to pool against the foundation wall, you want to fill this area with rock so it can perk. If the humidity levels in your house are 60% or better, you probably want to consider purchasing a dehumidifier. However, I recommend getting a high quality one like this one here. They cost probably one or $200 more than your store bought one. But these do a very good job of efficiently removing moisture. You can also set these and program them to the humidity level desired. The best humidity level to have inside the house is really 45%. This is where you're going to feel the most comfortable. You can also externally drain these. They have a connection on the side to where a hose can be run. If there was ever a way to determine the moisture load in your house without a humidity monitor, this is it. What you're looking at is a bucket of damp red. These can be purchased at Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart, and they're refillable best of all. This is a one quart size. What I recommend doing is writing the date on these and put them on the top shelf of your closet. Then after 30 days, go and check the bucket. You'll be amazed at how much water is in this bucket after you pull it out. I've been using these for probably three years now. Even though I have a very good variable speed system and I have the humidity levels down to around 50 to 45 percent, I still have to dump, dump these buckets about once every two months. The best piece of advice I can offer is really this right here. You really should have a humidity monitor so you'll know if you have a problem at all, which I'm sure you do. That's why I call this the invisible issue that nobody thinks they have. This is a wireless temperature and humidity monitor, and it comes with sensors. These are wireless. They can be placed in the attic, garage, crawl space, basement, anywhere you think there could be a moisture problem and usually is. This particular model here, the base station actually serves as a monitor. You have to disregard the bottom row here since I removed the sensors for the purpose of taking the photographs. But I highly recommend that you install these so you'll at least know if you have a problem and how bad the problem is. It becomes even more important after you discover there is a problem so now you want to know if you're able that the measures that you've taken are the proper ones to take. We also install these but you can purchase and put these in yourself. They're widely available online. This is the wireless systems we install. This is like the one you saw in the previous frame. On the top row here, we have 74 degrees indoor temperature, 
and 42% relative humidity. You're going to feel the most comfortable between 40 and 45%, even though 55% is deemed acceptable. Station number one here is actually the attic, where it's 82 degrees and 60% humidity there. The crawl space is at 77 degrees with 62% humidity. And I have one placed outside, and it's 80 degrees out there with 94% humidity, which is really high. So you can see now, I know that these other things are working properly, and the measures I've taken are working based on this outdoor temperature and humidity there. This is why it's really important that you monitor all your humid locations, and especially becomes more important if you take measures to correct it, because you have to know if those corrective measures are actually working. If you need us to come install one of these, we'd be glad to do it. But like I said, these are widely available online. And thanks for watching this video. I'm hoping I've given you some good points about how to monitor and maybe mitigate some of the moisture mold issues you could be having. This could more than likely a problem you don't even think you have now. But you will know if you have a problem if you start taking measures to identify these potential issues. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to Southern Home Talk. We're constantly committed to putting up videos that affect our houses here in South Alabama. And if you ever need a home inspection, please call us at 251-490-9892. I'm Chuck Phillip. Thanks for watching.